I will be forever the myth. You're the king of kings, though. <laughs> <laughs> There's always a pecking order. The little peckers never mess with the big peckers. So I'm a rooster, and he's a chicken, so to speak. of the Bodybuilding Legends podcast is brought to you by our sponsors, Old School Labs and Florida Alternative Medicine. All right, welcome everybody to another episode of the Bodybuilding Legends podcast where we talk to the legends of bodybuilding and we talk about the history of bodybuilding and I'm your host, John Hansen. And today we have a really special guest. Last year, if you remember, we started a new series about women bodybuilders, but unfortunately we didn't really get too many women to do interviews, so we didn't really have too many. We did one with Ruth Silverman which kind of introduced the new series. Since then, we haven't had any luck getting any of the women bodybuilders on the show to do interviews. But today, we have Corey Everson, who is one of the biggest names in women's bodybuilding, especially in the 1980s. Corey was Miss Olympia six times in a row, which was never done before back then. And she won it from 1984 to 1989 consecutive. And not only did she win six Olympias, but Corey was a real icon in the sport. Everybody loved her, one of the most popular bodybuilders in that era and in fact her and lee haney were both mr and miss olympia during the 80s and they were both great representatives for the sport and i remember i competed in 1985 at the mpc illinois and Corey was the guest poser there and the crowd just loved her they were so excited that Corey was coming so that's how she was thought of during that era and then she went on after her bodybuilding career ended she went on and did a tv show for a long time and then she also even appeared in quite a few movies so that's how popular Corey was so we're really really happy to have her here on the show with us today she's such a sweet person and such a great person so Corey and i are actually both from illinois and she didn't know that of course but i remember when i won my first teenage show i, I won my class at the 1981 aau teenage midwest open and it was in rockford illinois it was held by my friend kevin noble who used to hold some great contests out in Rockford. And Corey, that was her, I think that was her first contest. And she was from Illinois, Deerfield, Illinois. And she was going to college at the University of Wisconsin. And that was her very first contest. And she won the women's division. And back then, women's bodybuilding was just starting, but it was getting really, really popular. So we're going to talk about all that in our interview, which is going to come up in a minute. And before we get to that, I want to mention right off the bat that we are brought to you by our sponsor, who is Old School Labs. I have been with Old School Labs for several years now. This is the supplement company that draws on the wisdom of the golden era of fitness and bodybuilding to offer unique supplements for the discerning athlete. Old School Labs is the only brand I use, trust, and associate my name with. It's the brand I used to win the Natural Mr. Universe in 2012. You may have heard of their award-winning fat burner called Vintage Burn which is the world's first muscle preserving fat burner or vintage blast, which is their two stage pre-workout or vintage brawn, which is the triple protein isolate powerhouse. It's packed with eggs, milk, and beef protein. Their products have no proprietary blends, no artificial flavors, colors, or sweeteners. Old school labs is also the home of 1983, Mr. Olympia, Samir Banut and bodybuilding legend, Tom Platts. So use the discount code legends 12 and you will get 12% off your order when you go to oldschoollabs.com, old school labs supplements that make sense. All right. And speaking of old school labs, my fitness challenge, my John Hansen fitness challenge, which started, let's see, on January 20th, is really going good. I'm getting pictures each week from all the people who are in the challenge. Well, they're not sending me pictures each week, but they're sending me their measurements each week. And then every month, every like three or four weeks, they'll send me pictures. And Wow, a couple of these people are really making great progress. So I'm really happy to see that. And I, I check in with them every week. So this is really an intense program. It's not like I just give you a diet and then you're on your own for the next 12 weeks. I'm really on top of this and I'm checking in with them and they're checking in with me. So it's going really, really good. I'm going to do another fitness challenge maybe next month. Maybe I'll do one for the spring because this one really turned out good. And it's, um, these people are really making progress. So I'm really happy for all of them. And my seminar coming up quick, guys. It's only six weeks away. It'll be on March 21st and 22nd. And since this is my first one, I'm going to do a special announcement here. I'm going to do a special deal. If you come to my seminar and you pay for the seminar, you can bring a friend. 
you can bring someone with you. So if you're married and you want to come out to Tampa, Florida and attend my seminar and you want to bring your wife or your girlfriend or your boyfriend or whoever you have, you can do that. Bring someone or you want to bring your training partner. You guys can attend two for one. So I am doing that for this one time only because it is my first seminar and we're doing it in Tampa, Florida. And if you want to find out more details on that, just go to my website, which is johnhansonfitness.com. And you'll see it right on the front page there about the seminar, or you can go to the top and click on the seminar and you will get the whole breakdown of what we're going to be talking about. It's going to be a two day seminar, March 21st, 22nd, which is a Saturday and Sunday. And we will go over everything related to bodybuilding, how to build muscle, what kind of training programs work, how to put all this into a workout. We're going to figure out what works for you to build muscle, including how to overcome weak points, how to assess your genetic potential, everything. So we're going to talk about training. We're going to talk about nutrition. We're going to talk about supplements. And then we're going to go into the gym on the second half of each day. And I will take everybody through all the basic compound important movements, all the exercises that I think are the most important ones to learn. And we will do every body part. And we will go over that on two days, on Saturday and Sunday. So it's a really, really good deal. If you guys are into training and you want to really improve your fitness you want to get in great shape, you want to make some progress. I don't care if you're a teenager or you're in your 60s, it doesn't matter. We can all still learn. And it's a really reduced price now with this two for one discount. So if you really want to save some time, and there's nothing like getting hands on one on one instruction, it's just not the same getting it off the internet, or, uh, you know, you really because when I'm instructing people on these exercises, Sometimes it's just a little bit here, a little bit there. You got to turn your arm this way. You got to turn your leg this way, turn your foot in. It's just that little bit of detail, which I, of course, know all about since I've been doing this for so many years, and it would really make a difference. So go to johnhansonfitness.com. You can check it all out there. I've got all the details on there. It's going to be in Tampa, Florida. It's going to be great weather out here. So if you've never been out here or you're looking for a break from the winter where you're at, come out to Tampa, Florida next month, six weeks away. I hope to see you guys there. All right. What else is going on? Oh, they had some big news the other day in bodybuilding. AMI, American Media, which owned the Mr. Olympia, they bought it from Joe Weider. They have sold the Mr. Olympia now to Jake Wood. And Jake is a big sponsor of bodybuilding. He really loves women's bodybuilding. I've seen him uh, promote Tim Gardner shows out here in Tampa many times over the last five, seven years or so. And he was instrumental in getting the Miss Olympia to come back. So they're bringing the Miss Olympia back this year. So now Jake Wood has bought the Mr. Olympia, the title of the Mr. Olympia from AMI. So AMI no longer owns it. So Jake Wood is now running it. And he's got my friend Dan Solomon as the president. So Dan is going to be running the Mr. Olympia for the next five years. He signed a five-year deal. So congratulations to Jake Wood. Congratulations to my friend Dan Solomon. And really looking forward to it. we got some people running the sport now that are really into bodybuilding. So it should be interesting to see how it all goes down. And I was on YouTube a lot this week. I took my Frank Zane interview, which we did last week, and I put it on YouTube. This was a lot of work on my end because I took the audio interview that we did with Frank, which was a phone call interview, and I added all these pictures. I even put some video clips in there. And everything we talked about, it is now on film. It's now a video. So go to my uh, YouTube channel, which is under my name, John Hansen, and you will be able to see it there. It's getting a lot of hits, which it should, because, uh, of course, it's Frank Zane and one of the greatest bodybuilders ever. And this video really turned out great. So I hope a lot of people get a chance to see it. If you haven't seen it yet, go to my YouTube channel and check it out there. I am also posting workout videos each week now on YouTube. Last week, I did my shoulder workout. And this week, just yesterday, I put my back and biceps workout. So that is also on there. You can check that out under my YouTube channel. And speaking of Frank Zane, we got a ton of responses last week, both on YouTube, where I have the video. And I also got a lot of responses on my Facebook page about the Frank Zane interview. So people really, really liked it. So let me go over these comments on YouTube first. Stefanos Prokopis said bodybuilding would be better for everyone if the top guys looked the way Frank looked, concentrating on aesthetics and shape rather than just weighing as much as 300 pounds. Odessa File 75 said, I really enjoyed the interview. I met Frank Zane when he guest posed at the 1979 Mr. Canada in Montreal, as well as one year later in Hamilton. 
He was very kind, friendly, and encouraging to this then skinny 18-year-old Canadian. With respect to Franco as a rule, I don't like to think badly of the deceased, but I'm very surprised and disappointed that he actually would interfere with Zane's posing music, as Frank talked about in the interview. Multi Revelator said, the best interview I have heard with Zane, brilliant questions and the visuals really added to it. Frank speaks with such mental clarity and I was hanging on to his every word. You could tell he really got into the interview too. That was a very nice comment. That's the Zane interview he ever heard. Shade on a cool day said, John, it's a shame your channel isn't bigger. Will Frank be on RX Muscle? I know Dave wanted to interview him. I told Dave about Frank Zane, so hopefully Dave will get a hold of him. As far as the channel being bigger, I just got to get more people subscribing. And then I think the videos will get more views. So I'm hopefully going to be able to do that by adding more content each week. Guy Graham said, oh my God, Franco Colombo scratches Frank's music during a contest. David Wicklin said, Frank Zane affirming that in his eyes, being right on stage in the 1972 Mr. O, that Sergio, quote, should have won, unquote, really beating Arnold. But that was Arnold's home base in Germany. Plus, Serge Nubray said Weider switched the judges in 72, and they gave it to Arnold 4-3. to three. Anthony Slowinski said, cheers, John. Your interviews are great. Keep it up, mate. Dreadful Zach said, I almost did a backflip when I saw John interview Frank Zane. I can't wait to sit down and listen to this. Guy Graham said, I feel like I'm a kid opening Christmas presents when I turn on the computer and I see John's latest interview. Oh, my God. Frank Zane. I can't wait to see the interview. John, you are a champion and much heralded from documenting these interviews. Being the fan historian, I can only imagine how happy you get doing these interviews. Cheers from Australia. And then Rakanan, Rakan Can, I don't know how you say that. He said, fantastic interview. Thank you, Mr. Hansen. Also, wow, I'm so glad to hear finally from someone that was in the 1972 Mr. Olympia, Frank Zane himself, that Sergio should have won that contest. And the 1980 Olympia, Arnold, maybe fifth place. Jim K said, I can't blame Frank for being pissed off that Dickerson beat him in 82. Again, politics were involved because Frank boycotted 81. If Frank hadn't listened to Arnold and skipped the 80, bodybuilding history would have been much different. For that matter, the history would have been much different if Frank hadn't gotten injured in 80. Arnold would not have dared compete or he would have gotten creamed. The 80 Olympia cost Frank six or seven Olympias in a row. Wow. The 80 injury said, not the 80 Olympia. Gary Iannuzzi said, thank you for this one, John. Frank Zane has always been my favorite bodybuilder. He did a tremendous job with a high-definition body. That book alone is the best bodybuilding book in my collection, no offense, but I have yours too. They would put these YouTube gurus out of business, but hey, who still reads books? David Wicklin again said, awesome. Nice to hear the perspectives of someone who transcended eras like Frank Zane to get his retrospectives and views on how bodybuilding has changed so much. Maiden Shetty said, John, for your channel, it's always like first, and then we watch the content. Quality content is guaranteed. Frank Zane and Bob Paris, two of my all-time favorite physiques. Dean Blanchard said, wow, John, thanks. Awesome interview. Frank tells it like it is. We had a great privilege to attend Zane Haven. It changed our life. Christine and Frank were great mentors with most positive experience. I respect how Frank tells the story of life, how it was. Thanks so much for the podcast, John. Robert Damaris said, awesome interview, John. Funny part when you mentioned to Frank that he also had a dream about Ricky Wayne and Frank didn't remember. Actually, Robert, what part was cut up, we cut out a little bit of that interview because Frank's phone was really not picking up the sound at all. But I did tell Frank about the dream about Rick Wayne that I remember Frank had back in 1976. But uh, yeah, like you said, he just didn't remember. I love my mom said Zane is insane, awesome, a body we wish we actually had. William Flynn said, hey, John, all your interviews are really good. Your books are too. I'm around your age, and you are an inspiration on how hard you still train and diet. Spritz said, just subscribe, awesome. So that is it for the uh, YouTube comments. And then on my Facebook page, I also mentioned, of course, the podcast. Cliff Kuhn said, priceless interview. Rich Fitter said, give it a listen. Richard Baldwin said, great interview, John. And then I told him thanks. And he said, great interview, John. A lot of good questions and answers. Impressive interview. You did great, John. Paul Gabler said, obviously, he couldn't compete today as almost every division's competitors have usurped him at the Mr. O level, this level. But that does not detract from the fact that he had a perfect physique. Pete Pingle said, I can't wait to hear it. John, 
Frank Zane is the reason I started bodybuilding, and this picture is phenomenal. From the 1979 Mr. Olympia, Frank's greatest showing ever. Dan Johnston said, I'll check this one out. Joe Means said, I can't wait. Sergio Mochia said, great interview, John. Frank is just another one that can't find anything good to say about Arnold. I agree with him about Dickerson, worse Mr. Olympia, and Sergio was far more superior than Pearl. Lance Stranahan said, fantastic job, John. Easily the best interview I've heard with Frank Zane. Richard Perillo said, stellar interview. And Hannah Kaiser said, impressive. And then I have a John Hansen Fitness page on Facebook. And Terry Strand said, I just listened to the Zane interview. Just to reiterate that your interviews and info are easily far and away the best on the internet. You ask knowledgeable questions, and then you just let the subject tell his story. Palumbo is also an excellent interviewer, as he really engages his subjects. There are other gurus on the net, but they sit there rambling on, hardly letting their interviewees get in a word edgewise. I want to tell them to shut up, but I won't name any names. One of the most popular interviewers just sort of sits facing the camera with his champ guest, babbles on about how we used to be, blah, 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 and he was never really a bodybuilder at all. I've been working out my whole teen and adult life now and now senior life, and I can tell instantly if, he, if the speaker, the interviewer, has a clue as to what he's speaking about. And the gorilla in the room is the guys who have been on, quote, supplements for decades and would have no idea how to grow and cut and develop without their medicine cabinets. Let's see. Cliff Kuhn said, absolutely outstanding. Johnny Olson, my friend from the Boca area, said, awesome. Gregory Morton said, fantastic. Mario Nevis, who used to win all the titles in Illinois when I was there, said, the quintessential physique, bodybuilders have gotten bigger and bigger, but not better. This is about as good as a body can get. Symmetry, size, and definition in total balance. Raymond Cesar said, super great interview. Eddie Midyet, my friend Eddie from Powerhouse Gym, said, awesome. Richard Baldwin said, John, you keep getting better and better at these interviews. It really helps that you love the sport so much and you know so much about his history, as well as the fact that you yourself are an iron brother. And Patrick Neve said, great interview, John. And Gina Roccioni said, best poser. So that is it for our interviews. Thank you to everyone who uh, took the time out to make a comment, either on Facebook or even send me an email. If you want to send me an email, about this week's comments or about anything related to our show, you can send that to naturalolympia at gmail.com. That's my mailing address, natural, N-A-T-U-R-A-L, and Olympia, O-L-Y-M-P-I-A, all one word. And just send me any comments you have about anything we do on the show or what you think about this week's show. All right, before we get to our interview with Corey Everson, I also want to mention we are brought to you by our other sponsor, Florida Alternative Medicine, where age is just a number. If you want to feel great, optimize your energy levels, burn fat, and balance your hormone levels to maximize your potential, then go see the experts at Florida Alternative Medicine and Weight Loss. They have a certified and knowledgeable staff that will work with you to achieve your goals and get you the results you've been looking for. They offer a wide range of services that ensure you will not only look and feel amazing, but also be comfortable knowing they're there for you every step of the way. Their competitive pricing, along with their quality products and services, are just a few reasons to give them a call. So call them at their office number out here in Tampa, Florida, 813-922-8939. Or you can reach them at their website, which is flalternativemeds.com. Tell them that you heard their ad on the Bodybuilding Legends podcast, and you will get a free consultation. Plus, you will get 20% off your first order. All right. So here is our interview with six-time Miss Olympia, Corey Everson. You're going to really love this. All right, welcome back to the Bodybuilding Legend Show, and my very special guest this week is Corey Everson, six-time Miss Olympia. We are very honored to have you on the show, Corey. Thanks for joining us. Oh my gosh, I'm so glad to be here, and I'm glad you didn't forget about me just because I'm a has-been. <laughs> <laughs> no, you're never a has-been. Not with us. Thank Not in the bodybuilding world. <laughs> Thank you. Corey, first of all, I want to say my condolences to the passing of your ex-husband, Jeff, last year. I know you, you guys were still very close. So yeah. uh, that was a shock, I think, to everybody that he passed away. So my condolences on that. Thank you. It's still, I get really emotional. <laughs> I just wanted no, to I, that to I, do, I do appreciate that. So, yeah, my suggestion to people is everybody needs to get out there and get their physicals and have their heart checked yeah. and have their lungs x-rayed and know what your mm -hmm. blood pressure is and all your markers are because... Heart attacks are the silent killer, and that's for both men and women these days. And we just and it happens all the time, right? 
oh my gosh, it's it's and especially in bodybuilding. I mean, these guys have these yeah big big bodies, and their hearts are pumping a little bit extra hard. And usually, it mm-hmm. seems like the bodybuilders I've spoken to, they don't really like to do a lot of physicals unless they have kids. And it's really funny mm-hmm. to me. I mean, it's not funny to me, but I get it. But a lot of bodybuilders, unless they didn't have a family, they probably would just assume they're fine because they look good and yeah. they feel good. So, right, right. Anyway. Right. But thank you. You're welcome. Well, Corey, let's talk about how you got into bodybuilding. I, we are both from Illinois. Did you know that? No. Where are you from? Yeah. <laughs> I grew up in Worth, Illinois, which was a southwest suburb, and then I moved to Orland Park. So wow. uh, I was in the southwest suburbs. Well, Where did you grow up, Corey? I grew up in a place called Deerfield, which is oh yeah, right on, mm-hmm. yeah, it's, Deerfield. it's Lincolnshire, Deerfield, Highland Park, and I'm from a, yeah. a little area called Riverwoods, which is you know like a suburb of the suburb of Deerfield, and I go oh, back okay. all the time, and I love it, and I'm Do so you? grateful. Okay. Oh yeah, now I don't love the weather, but I love yeah. the, people. <laughs> the people are amazing. Right, I know, aren't they? I know Midwest people are the best. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I live in uh, Tampa, Florida now, so I go back to a couple times a year, and it's just great seeing my old friends, and my fam- all my yeah. family's still out there and everything, so. Yeah, mine yeah, too. Nothing so, like it. I brought my younger sister out here to California with me, but my older sister and my mom, they're all still back in Chicago area, so we go back a lot. How is your sister doing? She was a big star in the fitness world for many years. Oh, she's doing amazing. I mean, she's, yeah. she was always... She she was a two time Swiss National Fitness and the mm-hmm. best athlete I've ever met in my life. Like really? I was a good athlete, but she was a great athlete. And she was a wow. fearless athlete and you know, I always had a little bit of inhibitions about, you know, really a downhill skiing and stuff like that. She's fearless. Yeah. And even in wow. gymnastics <laughs> when we were in high school, she would just I'd go, Okay, let's do a round off back handspring back with a twist and she's like, Okay. Like fearless, you know, and so I was always jealous of that, but we're best friends. She's my very best friend in the whole world, and we spend Mm -hmm. every day together, and she's doing fantastic. Wow, that's awesome. Mm -hmm. Glad to hear that. I I remember her from the fitness world. And she looks looks so amazing. Oh, oh my gosh. Yeah, and she looks amazing still, and we go to the gym together, you know. Wow, nice. At least three or four days a week. We don't train real hard, but we go together and we enjoy each other's company and we just do enough that we maintain our shape and stay in pretty good shape for our yeah. age. So you said you were an athlete. So when did you start competing in athletics? Was that in high school? Yeah, so earlier. You know, I, I was a track athlete mm-hmm. ever since I was a little okay. kid. My mom was a great athlete in Germany growing up. She was a track athlete and probably would have been in the Olympics if the war didn't break out. And my dad was a gymnast and Mm. every sport. And so then when they came over here to the United States, they're both from Germany, they started playing tennis. And I mean, I grew up thinking my mom was what most moms are supposed to be like. And she was strong as an ox, did everything on her own. I mean, would pick up the picnic table with one hand to sweep underneath it. I mean, did all the landscaping on her own and four years old and she's still just an animal. And I I love it. And so to me, I grew up with that as my norm. And the the interesting thing is Jeff's mom was exactly the same way. And, you know, yeah. And so I think he grew up having a really strong mother figure. I mean, she lived until she was 94, but her biceps were bigger than mine, you know, all the <laughs> way in her entire life. And she was a nurse yeah. and she never lifted a weight. I mean, just genetically. So, Jeez. you know, it's like what you see around you is kind of like what you expect everybody to be like. And it's like, wait a second, your mom can't do that, you know, and you can't do that. <laughs> and anyway, yeah, we were blessed. What was your physique like, you know, talking about bodybuilding, what was your physique like when you were in track? Did you see the, Same. you know... Yeah, like your mom. Yeah, yeah. I think I'm more muscular than my mom. I take, I would, I think I took after my dad a little bit more. But my physique when I was a track athlete was, I mean, that's why I started bodybuilding because Jeff was the strength coach and he was the strength coach for all the teams. And I met him because I was a pentathlete in college. And um, 
my three girlfriend, my other three pentathletes on our team or four, you know, we'd go up into the weight room and we, it was just when weight started for women. We were like, yeah, the, you know, the newbies at it. And he was amazed at, at, you know, just that we, we were, you know, training the way we were because he had trained a world record holder of female named Pam Jacobson in the deadlift. And mm. she was amazing. And so, you know, we came in there going, okay, we want to do it too. Like we didn't really know what <laughs> we were doing, but we knew that we were good at it and we wanted to be strong and we wanted to be better pentathletes. And so he noticed my physique because I was a gymnast and then I was a track athlete and I was a swimmer. And so I kind of had developed all the muscles in my body because of the different sports I was in. And so it was Jeff who said, hey, you should try to compete in this bodybuilding contest, this Miss Mid-America or whatever the first one was. And I didn't really have to train that much for it because I was kind of already ready for it. Mm -hmm. So Yeah, that was, I think, know. Miss Midwest, right? That was in Rockford? Yes. And Tina Plackinger yeah. was in it. And I can't remember the other girls' names, but we had so much fun. And it was... <laughs> Like, I didn't know how to pose, and so I did, like, a little gymnastics-y type routine and uh -huh. um, didn't, re you know, I think I kind of started that, you know, because I didn't know how to pose. And so I just kind of threw in a pose in between, you know, like a gymnastics turn right. or something. <laughs> um, but it was so much fun, and and it was something that I enjoyed so much that I was like, I need to do this again. And, you know, that's kind of how it all started. Yeah, that was an amazing event. I was actually in that contest. I won the teenage. I won my class in the teenage. I'm a couple years younger than you. Are and, you uh, Tim, kidding? Yeah, That's so <laughs> yeah. Cool. 1981, Teenage mid Midwest. Oh. Yeah, I remember you. I remember you from the show. Oh my gosh, that's so great! Oh my god, and Tim, I love that. Tim Dolnap won that show, right? Yes, he did. Yeah, yes. he was a freak. <laughs> oh my gosh, yes. Yeah, I mean, that, and now, he, now an he's really event. lean. Yeah, he's really lean. Oh, is he? And he okay. Yeah, he's doing fantastic. And he, oh, you know, he's okay. real lean. His physique is completely different nowadays, where most of the guys are. You know, they've lost. Yeah. You look at even like Lee Haney. He's dropped. Mm -hmm. I mean, who needs to carry all that mass around them? If, you yeah, know, it's not healthy. So, right, no, exactly. Right. So, I, I, to answer your question, I kind of was built the same. I was about 145 pounds, which I mm -hmm. am right now at 62 still weigh the same, still look the same, still can fit in all wow. the same clothes. The composition for me now is probably more like it was when I was in high school. And then when I was competing, mm -hmm. I was, I was more defined, you know, and doing, cause I was training mm -hmm. six hours a day, but I, my dimensions, everything, my proportions and my body weight kind of stays the same. I, I carry more fat now and less muscle, unfortunately, mm -hmm. but compared to then, but I really didn't change a whole lot. Wow. That's amazing. So what was the feedback, Corey, after that show? Because, you know, you go on your very first show, you win it, and it was pretty competitive, right? There was three classes and a lot of girls in each class. I know. And there was some really good girls in it, too. It was like, mm -hmm. you know, I think the Wisconsin girls and the, you know, Illinois girls, I think we really, you know, brought in some some muscle. Yeah. It was great feedback. And I think people kind of liked the routine because it wasn't the same just posing type thing. So they kind of mm -hmm. like that. And then look at how good Tina Plackinger ended up being for a poser. Yeah. You yeah. know, it was great feedback. There was not, I've never had feedback like, Oh, why are you doing that? You know, that's a, mm -hmm. a man's sport. I've never had any negative feedback. Maybe it's just the people I hang around or maybe people have just are accepting it, you know, or maybe it wasn't so different what we were doing that it was so it was drawing so weird, you know, weird attention to it. It was just, yeah. we just looked like gymnasts up there posing. Mm -hmm. And that was right when women's bodybuilding started, right? Because I think like the national level, well, the Miss Olympia, the first one was 1980. So this was early 1981. Yeah. So this was really right at the infancy of it, right? It really was. And I know that there was the people I would look at that Jeff would show me in the magazines was Lynn Conkright. Carla Dunlap, Rachel McLeish, a girl named Georgia Fudge. Georgia Miller Fudge, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. And yeah. Then, um, she lives uh, out here in Florida. No kidding. And then yeah. um, Rachel, of course, who she mm -hmm. got so much attention. She's so beautiful and still to this day is as beautiful as she's yeah. ever been. 
Right. But those were those were kind of the people that the little blonde, little teeny weeny little blonde girl. I cannot. Stacy Bentley. Oh, Stacy Bentley. Yeah, she just passed away recently, I know. Uh, last year. I know. Yeah. I can't believe it. But those were the people who, you know, were the you know my peers, and um, mm-hmm. you know, I had different ones when I was in track. You know, they were the pentathletes were bigger and stronger and more muscular. So to me, it was a little bit easier to go into bodybuilding than it was to be a world class pentathlete because the girls yeah. were just insane athletes. And as good as I was, I would never have been as good as them. So mm-hmm. it was it was fun. It was like, OK, I'm going to be graduating from college soon. What can I do that's fun? And I had mm-hmm. never ever expected that I would be doing bodybuilding from the time from 1980 until basically 1990. I never yeah. in my life would have, would have guessed that. Wow. <laughs> That's crazy. Was, uh, was Jeff in the uh, men's show? Was he in the Mr. Yeah. West? I don't think okay. he was in that one. He was in another one after that. He won it and did absolutely fantastic. And when I first started out, I kind of, do you remember a girl named Stacy Gruel too? That name. Yeah. She was yeah. tall blonde. Beautiful girl. I think she posed mm-hmm. with John Brown. She when yes, we first she started, the emphasis was on couples for uh, for me and for Jeff. We weren't really so oh, much okay. thinking about the individuals, and which was, I'm glad we started out that way because I never would have had the confidence to compete in a higher level women's bodybuilding contest. But the couples I could do because it was a little less stress. And even though mm-hmm. there was more stress probably for the training and the and preparation because you had to you had to pose, you had to work on a routine together, it had to be timed. You had to we learned lifts from Mr. Schultz, who actually was an acrobat in the cir- and he had a circus that he ran and he taught us certain mm-hmm. acrobatic lifts that they did, strongman lifts. So mm-hmm. Jeff and I had these really great lifts and we had to do them right because I weigh 145 pounds. You know, I'm not like one of the little girls that you know, is a couple's competition, you know, with a bigger guy. I'm a big girl. Yeah. So yeah. anyways, it was, I loved couples more than I loved any individual bodybuilding I've ever been in. It was so neat to do something together <laughs> with somebody and the, you double the emotion, double the fun, you know, yeah. double the pleasure. Yeah. So I loved it. Yeah. You're right. The couples was a real big thing right back then it when women's bodybuilding gorgeous. started. Oh my yeah. gosh. It was so beautiful. Now, what did, what did Jeff say after you won that first show of the Miss Midwest? Well, he was always so unbelievably proud of me, you know, mm-hmm. I mean, from even before I was competing until when we retired, you know, it was, he just was so proud of me because he saw the dedication I had. And I, you know, I'm not, I'm not the biggest and I'm not the strongest. And you know, he saw that I just worked so hard, hours and hours and hours, and whether it was perfecting my posing routine or Mm -hmm. uh, perfecting my body or, you know, I always, I probably was always overtrained, to be honest. I Mm -hmm. didn't know how to stop because (laughs) I figured the other girls were going to be bigger and stronger. And so I had to be more symmetrical or bring something that maybe they didn't have. And so that's why my routines were always kind of extravagant. And, you know, I was lean, but not overly lean. And, but he was always so proud of me. And so then we, he still didn't, I mean, it wasn't like we're thinking, oh, I'm going to compete in bodybuilding. I was an interior designer and I was, Mm -hmm. that was my focus was this is fun. And my life starts when I get a full-time job as an interior designer. And so, (laughs) um, like, I never sat back and thought, okay, I'm going to be Miss Olympia one day. It never, ever was a thought in my mind. It just, because I was in it in the beginning of the sport, it just kind of all, you know, the path opened up in that direction. Now, your muscular development might not have been that advanced at your first show, but you, you had that structure, right? You had that you were tall and you had a really good structure. And so that yeah. must have been evident to everybody from the beginning, right? I think so. And I, and, you know, and I had that athletic build and I had the mm-hmm. sprinter's hamstrings, which I think in a, a lot of cases would separate me from another athlete as I had those big hamstrings. And yeah. um, everybody on my track team had those big hamstrings. So, you know, so you know, in bodybuilding, mm-hmm. it was so unusual, but on the 
you know, at the track, at UW track, it was like everybody had those big hamstrings. Right. So then later that year, you go into the Central USA, which I think was in August. And I, I remember you on that show because I wasn't in that one, but I went and watched it. And I remember when uh, Warren Langman, the uh, promoter, came out and gave you the trophy, you picked him up. Remember that? No, <laughs> Because I remember that made all the magazines. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. Oh, that is so funny. I can, I don't even remember doing that, but I did that. No. Also the, the prime minister of Slovakia, when oh, I went really? and did a, an appearance there with um, Nasar Al Sambadi, that was the athlete's uh-huh. name that I traveled there with. And the, I think it's called the prime minister. He was, um, or the president or whatever you'd call it, but he was a boxer and he just really mm-hmm. dug the fact that we were athletes and he was, you know, showing us around his um, man, the mansion, and I picked him up, and then he picked me up, and then it was actually on the cover of the news in the Slovakian <laughs> news. That's mm-hmm. so funny. But yes, <laughs> I do remember doing that. And then when I won yeah. the first Miss Olympia, I think I picked up Carla Dunlop, too. <laughs> Golly. <That's funny. laughs> so after you win uh, your second show then that year, did you feel like, okay, let me try this further? Let me go to the nationals or, or you know, the national level? No, I still really just thought it really? was fun, and I still, I don't know when I really got really serious about it. I just still mm-hmm. wanted to, my focus was couples. I mean, honestly, it was, okay. we, our focus was we wanted to win the couples and, you know, go to the regionals and then the nationals, mm-hmm. and we really wanted to take that, you know, because Jeff wasn't the biggest of, of the bodybuilders. He was the tallest for sure, mm-hmm. but you yeah. know, he wasn't. Yeah. And, and so we just thought we were so well balanced, you know, blonde, tall, lean, muscular, that we could do well in the mm-hmm. couples. And so honestly, that was still my focus was I never okay. even thought at this point about the, my future as an individual competing. Hmm. Wow, that's wild. How many couple shows did you guys do? I'm not sure exactly, but it was at least, you know, somewhere between seven, seven, maybe seven. Wow. It was whichever okay. ones they, there were, we were in. And then yeah. the one that is the best contest I've ever been in my entire life. I looked the worst that I've ever looked in my entire life, but it meant so <laughs> much to me because I had had a blood clot and they almost mm. amputated my leg. And it was 1980, I don't remember when, it was maybe 1980 or 1982, I think it was 1982, and I had this blood clot in my leg, and I didn't know Mm. what it was, and it turns out I have a blood clotting disorder that is passed down from my mom's side of the family, and it's hereditary, and it's also very prevalent in Germans, which I'm 100% German, and Mm -hmm. so Jeff and I were supposed to compete in a contest that weekend and I was in Chicago working as an interior designer and we were going to do couples and I was put into the hospital and I was in the hospital for was an intensive care for 10 weeks I was in critical care for another four and then I had to learn to walk again and Jeff was at my side every night and even though they weren't allowed in the intensive care unit he stayed there anyways Mm -hmm. and just sat and he was studying (laughs) for his doctorate degree And so he would sit there in this hard wooden chair on my right side. I still can see it. And he would study. He'd be studying chemical balancing formulas and all this stuff. Mm -hmm. And then I was laying there with IVs in my arms and my leg elevated. And the doctor absolutely stumped not knowing what the heck was going on. I'm a young athlete. Why do I have a blood clot? You know, that's for old people who are sedentary. And they didn't even have the testing done back then for the blood clotting disorder. It wasn't even developed yet. Mm. And the doctor, you know, the very primitive internets that they had back then, the doctor saw that there was some girl in in Iceland who had a similar thing. And because of the studies he did with the girl in Iceland who had the same thing, they put me on this medicine called streptokinase, which is like Drano, and it eats away clotting in your in your vessels and Mm -hmm. you know which is very dangerous because it could you could have an aneurysm or internal bleeding and all this other stuff but anyway so the you know after I learned how to walk again and the doctor said I would never be able to compete again and I probably wouldn't be able to walk normally because the inside of my leg was scarred up 
we competed in the national championships in Las Vegas, and I looked like crap, and I was so skinny, and I lost all my muscle, <laughs> and I was so thin, but we competed, wow. and we won it, and not only you won did it. we win wow. it, <laughs> yeah, not the, I didn't add anything at all to the win, but Jeff looked amazing, and I happened to, you know, what the emphasis really wasn't on how muscular the women were anyway, but, right. you know, the our victory there was, oh my gosh, we proved the doctors wrong, and we competed, mm. and we won, and I'm alive, and my leg wasn't amputated, and Jeez. it was like the victory of life, and right. that is why that is my favorite contest. You know, people say, which Miss Olympia was your favorite contest? Well, actually, it was that contest that we won the couples championships because of that victory. Right, right. So bef when you were in the hospital, they were going to amputate your leg because they didn't know what to do. They didn't know what to do. And unless I started to get blood flow, they were mm -hmm. worried about because the clot was in my iliac, femoral, and popliteal veins. So from my hip to my toes, it was totally clotted. Oh, wow. And my leg was like Tom Platz's leg. I mean, it was so swollen and it was so mm -hmm. painful. And what happens is your secondary capillarization starts to take over for the veins that aren't functioning. And my secondary capillarization became my primary capillarization. And so because I was in such good shape, my other veins took over for the for the deep veins. And so mm -hmm. my leg was, was spared. So thank God wow. for that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I remember. I remember the story about having a blood clot in your leg, but I didn't know it was that that involved. I didn't know they were going to amputate it. Oh God, it was so bad. I mean, and it's actually now they have the testing done where they do protein C deficiency and protein S deficiency and factor V laden, which is all blood clotting disorders. And you can actually have that disorder and never even experience a blood clot. But, you know, if you have two of them, then it exacerbates the chances that you will have it. And I happen to have two of those blood clotting right. disorders. And wow. um, again, it's really, it's more common in Germans than any other nationality. Right. So after you got over that, how did, the, uh, how did they prevent that from happening again? I don't know, really. I mean, at that point, they thought it was like a, a one-off, you know, where it was just okay. something went wrong. Just like, one time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And not until, let's see, when my mom turned 50, then she got a blood clot. And then they said, what's going on with this family? You know, what's going on with her blood? At that point, they had developed this testing. And so they saw that my mom has the same blood clotting disorder that I have. So it comes from, mm. you know, that side of the family. And then they can put you on like Coumadin or Eliquis and things yeah. that keep your blood. So. Yeah, like I said, that was 40 years ago, so they didn't really know what yeah. they were doing as far as that goes. Yeah, wow. Yeah, so the years in between, you know, from competing until, you know, when I actually went on, the Eloquist is just, I guess, luck that nothing else happened, mm -hmm. you know, but, you know, staying in shape and moving your feet and walking around and drinking fluids and not doing, you know, drugs and not smoking mm -hmm. and alcohol mm -hmm. and just, you know, being healthy and not letting myself get dehydrated too. Yeah. Wow. Now you won the North American championships in 82, right? So was, was that after the uh, blood clot incident? Yeah, I think it was. Yes. Okay. And yeah, how was that experience? Those, it was great. You know, I mean, a lot of yeah. it, you know, the, in those years, you know, it, again, women's bodybuilding was just kind of starting. I mean, we had, yeah. you know, Rachel to look up to and Carla Dunlap and, Kiki Aloma and, you mm -hmm. know, these girls were just beautiful and, you know, kind of gymnasty type bodies. And so yeah. it, it was not so difficult to get in shape back then because the competition was more achievable, you know, like the, the body was, a, the muscularity was a little bit more achievable, you know, for mm -hmm. anybody mm -hmm. who just started lifting weights. It's like, whoa, I'm looking really good. I think I'm going to compete. And, yeah. you know, I think it really made the sport grow fast because yeah, you know yeah. you, you were little and you still looked pretty and you but mm -hmm. yet you had muscle and um you know a lot of women didn't really have that kind of muscle but they really liked the independence it gave them and the strength it gave them and 
you know, I always looked at bodybuilding as it's just another sport. You know, I was a swimmer, a gymnast, a track athlete. I played mm-hmm. badminton in college, you know, on, on the um, varsity team. And so it was just like another sport. And still, I wasn't thinking of the big picture. I was just thinking of, oh, this is great that Jeff and I can do together until, mm-hmm. you know, we don't want to do it anymore. And then I'm going to be an interior designer because my degree was in yeah. art and interior design. Right. Where did you go to uh, college, Corey? University of Wisconsin-Madison. Okay, gotcha. Yeah, we just did an interview with Roger Schwab, who used to be the head judge for the IFPB back in the late 70s. And uh, we were talking about how when women's bodybuilding started, the women were, it was so popular, you know, and it was just yeah. really caught on. And I think it was the novelty of, you know, seeing women with muscles. But you're right. I mean, they weren't very big, but they were all beautiful and they just looked so great. And it I just know. really caught on. I mean, it got media attention and it didn't take long before everybody was starting to compete in it. And there was a ton of competitors. So it was I really mean, even a great, the draw- great beginning. We had the biggest draws at the Miss Olympia competitions in the Felt Forum in, in New York. And yeah, it, unbelievable. We didn't even have the men there. It was just the women's right, Olympia. Right, by itself. It was, yeah. It was crazy. I mean, <laughs> you couldn't even buy tickets to get to go see it. It was unbelievable. unbelievable. Yeah. And, but, and you media know what, coverage, what, what, like na- you know, national television uh, was covering it. Unbelievable. I mean, and even when I first started and then Jeff and I started that show body shaping and then, you know, it was unusual for, you know, a woman to be teaching people how to do weights and everything was hard work. Even, you know, if you're a woman, you're going to be carrying more body fat. So you might have to work out twice as hard as a guy just to get your body Mm -hmm. fat down so that you have a little bit of definition. And I think, I mean, I think it's really, really hard to get definition and you've got to really work your butt off and, mm-hmm. and eat right and really be like you've got to be in it 24 7 you cannot compete and then take six months off like I think that was the my biggest problem is from the point of like 1980 until 1990 I never took a break and I was mm-hmm. always on and I was always trying to be in shape and I never wanted to represent myself or the sport in a bad light and I always wanted to be in great shape if I guess posed I wanted people to get their yeah. money's worth I wanted to be nice I wanted people to have a good experience and I think I got burnt out you know I mean mm. because the guys can kind of guess pose and they can be big and it's amazing because they're so big and the people clap yeah. and they love it because they're ginormous but if a woman is just a little overweight she just looks like she's a little bit chunky on stage, you know, where a guy mm-hmm. looks like a mountain. And <laughs> so I always was like, okay, I'm never going to misrepresent. I'm going to always come in in great shape because I want people to, to be proud of me. And I want people to feel as though I gave them a hundred percent. Right. So what was your training routine? Like were you training like six days a week? Yes, I did. And even on the seventh day, I would do activities. I'd play <laughs> tennis or I'd swim or I'd mm-hmm. hike. I didn't know how to tone it down. And yeah. everybody thought it was so easy for me, but really it was a lot of stress. It was a lot mm. of stress. And, wow. you know, because you're almost like in a bubble, people look at you and they want to be like you. And no matter where mm-hmm. you go, they want to see what you're eating see what you're doing, yeah. <laughs> see where you're training. And so you're kind of in this bubble. And I would guess pose probably every weekend almost of the year, or I would do some wow, no kidding. We would, oh my gosh, it was like every weekend wow. putting that fake tan on. Oh, I hated that yeah, part. Every week, right. <laughs> and then you scrape it off and then you put it back on again. And then right. you it off. Oh my gosh. And then, so it was more stressful than even I could recognize to myself. I I recognize it now because Mm -hmm. I can sit back and look at it, but it was like, I tell people it's almost like I was in college. I was a college athlete until I was 32. I trained as hard as a college athlete until I was about 32 and I never took a break and I almost didn't even really grow up. You know, I was like a college athlete for so many years. And then all of a sudden when I quit, I'm like, okay, now what? Okay, let's yeah. have, let's have kids. So. <laughs> yeah, you're right. I remember when you were competing and you were Miss Olympia. I remember that was. I think that everybody thought the same thing that you were just this 
really genetically gifted. And I, I think probably everybody thought it probably came easy to you because you won six Miss Olympias in a row, mm-hmm. which was never done before. And mm-hmm. so I think everybody just looked at you as this really genetic, genetically gifted woman, you mm-hmm. know, who just can come in and just take over easily, you know, but mm-hmm. I didn't know it was that much work for you. Oh, it was so much work. And I, it wasn't like, I, I do believe that I had gifted genetics and, and that I was tall and had a little waist and big shoulders. Mm-hmm. And, mm-hmm. you know, I had a good, you know, I had great genetics from my mom and my dad and, and I was an athlete from day one. So I had developed certain muscle bellies, you know, that maybe other athletes had not, not developed yet, you know, or maybe yeah. never developed because mine were developed from track when I was a kid. But, you know, I mean, in hindsight, would I do things differently? I would have pulled myself out of having to do so much guest posing and appearances throughout the year because I think it made me burn out in when you added all those 10 years of doing that together. Yeah. And I would have taken a little bit more breaks, you know, in between. But, you know, it's fun when you're doing it and you're, you're, on top of the world and you're thinking, Oh my gosh, I'm only young once. I might as well go for it and do it now Mm -hmm. while we're young. Mm -hmm. And I think it, I think it was like almost emotionally harmful in that it was almost too much. You know, it just burnt me out. Even though I loved it, I just think human beings need a rest. And I don't think I gave myself that rest. And and we as humans need, we need to have a more balanced life, mind, body, and and faith, you know, and I didn't have those three balanced very well. Let me ask you about 1984, because that was the year that you went to the MPC Nationals and you won the heavyweight and the overall. So that mm-hmm. allowed you to turn pro. And mm-hmm. then right away, you go into the Miss Olympia the same year and you win. Mm-hmm. <laughs> That's mm-hmm. unbelievable. So your very mm-hmm. first pro show is the Miss Olympia and you win. That was pretty amazing. I mean, I remember I won the I won the national, which was incredible. And then mm-hmm. we were thinking, do we want to wait a year and just take advantage of, you know, having won the amateurs, you know, for mm-hmm. a year and or do we just go and jump right in? I'm in shape, you know, it was like in a month and a half. Should I just compete in that? And so we decided we would go ahead and compete in it and it's so funny because Joe Weeder actually called me and asked me not to compete. <laughs> Really? Because <laughs> yeah. he just was like, you know, because he had, he had me and he had Rachel. And so he was probably thinking, oh, my gosh, you know, Rachel, right. why don't we have a, we're a champion amateur and a champion professional? You know, and I'm like, Jeff, yeah. I'm, I'm not even going to get in the top 10. Like, honestly, Jeff and I just were like, <laughs> let's just try to get in the top 10 this year. And then and I even borrowed Rachel's suit for it. You know, she let me, she let really? me her black. Uh huh. She was really sweet. And then, you know, I competed and I can't believe I won. It was a total shock because the head judge, a guy named Julian, I can't remember his last name. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. He actually didn't even have me in the top 10, you know, and he just, Hmm. yeah, he didn't even have me score in the top 10, but everybody else did. And so I just remember so clearly, like it was yesterday, looking down and seeing Jeff a little nervous and looking Mm -hmm. at Rick Wayne. And Rick Wayne had the biggest smile on his face, and he kept giving me the thumbs up sign. And I'm like, <laughs> okay, Jeff looks nervous, but Rick Wayne is giving me the thumbs up sign. He was like, my, right. <laughs> he he was like my backup, you know. And he's just uh-huh. like, giving me a smile, a thumbs up, and and so I was like, okay, I must be doing pretty good. I don't know, you know. And so um, <laughs> it was really amazing when I won. And then Carlo was so cute; she jumped into my arms. You know, like a little oh, really? just jumped, jumped up, and I was <laughs> hugging her, and so right. cute. So it was great. We and I made a lot of friends that year too. And there was some athletes from Holland, and they were from all over the world. So it was pretty, yeah, pretty amazing. So Rachel was second. So how did that? How did it feel to beat Rachel? Because Rachel was already a two-time Miss Olympian, of course, an icon of the sport up to that point, right? Well, you know, I. I come from a different background of being an athlete and being a track athlete where, you know, if somebody's better than me, I'm going to say, Hey man, you did great. Congratulations. Mm -hmm. You look amazing. Or, you know, if somebody beats me in the pentathlon, I honor them. You know, I mean, it's like, I put my hands up to them. You know, they're, Mm -hmm. they worked harder than they worked harder than me or they somehow worked more gifted than me. So when I beat Rachel, it didn't even, didn't even, 
strike my mind like I beat anybody. You know, I think in bodybuilding, mm-hmm. I always looked at it like you either were your best that day or you weren't. So you either, you know, get to, you get a trophy or you win, but I never see mm-hmm. it as beating anybody. Like it, I never okay. looked at it like beating anybody. And yeah, I think I'm glad I looked at it that way. And, you know, because you're competing against yourself, you're really not competing against anybody. You're really competing against yourself. Mm-hmm. And that's how I've always looked at it. So I don't think she liked it very much, but who would, you know, it's like you, you're yeah. the reigning champ and you're supposed to win and you're beautiful and you've got this yeah. incredible body and you're in tip top shape and some newcomer little knucklehead comes in and, you know, <laughs> right. you. First, first pro show. Yeah, exactly. So I wouldn't have liked it either, you know, but it is what it is. And so then it just made it harder next for the next year. It was, it was once you win, Every year, Jeff used to always say, you've got to be better than you were the uh, the last year because people are going to be trying to look for something that's not right so that you mm-hmm. don't get to win. You know, you have to be better so it's unquestionable that yeah. you get the title. And so, you know, then I started getting nervous. So after that first Miss Olympia, it's like, okay, this is like serious business. And I never yeah. thought... I, I wasn't expecting to win, and I thought I would get in the top ten. And now it's serious business, so I had to take things really seriously then. Yeah, yeah. So now you're looking at it as a business now, right? Now you're guest posing, and you're Miss, the reigning yeah. Miss Olympia. And, you know, I, yeah. I, I competed in a, a contest in Chicago in 85, and you were the guest poser there, the 85 Illinois State. So that was oh. the year after you won the first one, yeah. Wow. Yeah. I mean, it was, it was like, because it, again, it was so new and, uh-huh. you know, we were booked up every weekend for guest posings because I always would come in in shape and I had these great routines yeah. and these great outfits and it was so odd to have a woman guest pose, you know, and yeah, my routine was like twice as long as like a male guest poser. And, mm-hmm. you know, I think I just gave them a good show and, you know, that made me proud of myself and, and made Jeff proud of me and made the audience happy. And that's what I number one wanted to do was give the audience a good show and yeah. let the promoter know, I will never let you down. And mm-hmm. I think that's where you know, from like 84 on, I think is where I started feeling more, more stress because everybody wants yeah. to take your title away. Everybody wants your title. Everybody wants to find flaws in you. Then the rumors start, then, you know, it's, um, it just, everybody's after you and it's mm-hmm. probably like in any sport. What did you and Jeff feel like you guys, you needed to improve on for the next year after that first win? Cause I'm sure every year it was like, we have to make improvements. We have to make improvements. Um, I think I needed more def- um, like definition in the muscles, you know, because I, mm-hmm. I think I probably carried a little bit more water, body fat, whatever you want to call it. Um, but I wasn't able to put on a lot of muscle, you know, between the years of 1984 and 89. You know, I worked mm-hmm. my butt off. Let me tell you, I don't know anybody who worked harder than me in the gym. Yeah. I got stronger. Wow. I was like a beast. I got so strong, but it was never for like a single repetition. It was Mm -hmm. for 10 reps. I could do, you know, I had muscle endurance. I didn't have like the muscle strength to do like one max out. It was more of like muscle endurance. And so my muscles didn't really get bigger, but they got denser and they got just like more definition, but they really didn't get it. If you'd measure my body from 1984 to 1989, it probably was exactly the same, you know, but Mm. one year I might be a little more defined and then I might not be as defined and play games with the media. Like we'd say, wow, Corey has great tricep definition this year. Well, it was no different than the year before, but we would bring attention to it. So, so (laughs) people would be like, wow, her tricep improved so much when she did it, you know? Right. (laughs) Well, I'm sure Jeff helped you out too, right? Because he was a strength coach. I'm sure he was able to design your routines for the year oh, yeah. and, and figure out ways to improve. Yeah. Oh my gosh, yes. He wrote them up on a piece of paper. And my yeah. training partner, Darcy, and I, we would go to the gym and we'd have whiteouts. And if we didn't want to do chin-ups, we'd white it out. And we'd never show <laughs> Jeff that we whited out the stuff we didn't want to do. <laughs> right. 
How did you do it with the, all the guests posing and stuff? Because like most bodybuilders will have an off season where they'll, you know, the guys will at least gain a lot of weight and they'll bulk up and then they'll mm-hmm. cut down for the contest. But if you were busy guest posing all year, you know, how did you manage that with the training and, and you know, and then still getting ready for the next Miss Olympia the following year? I never really let myself gain more than like eight pounds. You know, I just, wow. I would train as hard in my off season and I'd eat pretty much the same year round. I never really would eat horrible. You know, I mm-hmm. never really would go on and because I think women don't do the bulk up thing like the guys do. And I don't even yeah. think it's that good for them because right. you end up losing all that weight anyway. So why put it yeah. on in the first place? And right. I'll, Albert Beckles used to say that. He's like, why not stay within 10 pounds of your contest weight year round so it's easy to get into that shape? And that's the philosophy mm-hmm. that I always took. And mm-hmm. I don't like the way I look if I'm heavy anyways, you know. Yeah. And then I guess posed all the time. So I, it would be, that's where I think I got stressed. Guess posing and looking good and then training. Yeah. And even when we would go on, on trips to New Zealand or to Australia or to Alaska, it was always, I had to get that workout in, which, you know, in hindsight. It wasn't like you're on vacation. <laughs> I, yeah, there was no vacation, you know. No. It, it was fun, <laughs> but it was because I'm a perfectionist. It's my fault, you know, because I'm a mm-hmm. perfectionist. And some people would just take advantage of them being in Australia and have fun, you know, but not me, you know, it's like, you know, I'm a perfectionist and I'm not going to let that happen. Mm-hmm. And I think, I think, I know a lot of women that are perfectionists like that. And, you know, your, your livelihood is dependent upon your name and how you look. And I remember hearing a lot of promoters saying they brought so-and-so in to guest pose and they looked horrible and they were overweight and the crowd didn't mm-hmm. like it. And I'm like, I am not letting that happen. You know, this yeah. is my job. Yeah. I am not letting that happen ever. Right. Was your metabolism pretty fast, Corey? Were you able to, I think it, you know, I think it was. stay lean? I think yeah. my, okay. Mm-hmm. I mean, I've always been, you know, like that. I mean, I've, I've never been heavy. You know, I've always been, mm-hmm. you know, just an athlete. And the more muscle you have, the higher your, your metabolism is. So when you're training hard and, you know, eating correctly, you really can eat a lot of food because you're not eating a lot of junk, empty calories. Mm-hmm. They're good calories mm-hmm. and you're you're definitely burning them off. Yeah. Were you surprised at how popular you were? Because I remember, like, even when you guest posed in 85, and that was the first year where you were the reigning Miss Olympia, I remember the crowd was just so, you know, I remember even in the magazine coverage and everything, you were really, really popular. You were definitely the most popular woman bodybuilder in the world. I was so surprised by that. I mean, (laughs) like, unbelievably surprised. And still I am surprised. It's like, I don't know. I mean, I I just don't understand. I don't know why, you know, and, Mm -hmm. and... I don't, I still don't know why, you know, people are so nice and they're so kind and, you know, people that you've never met, you know, and they're, they're just so unbelievably nice. And I don't know where that popularity came from, but I do know that, you know, throughout those 10 or 12 years that I was in, in the limelight, there was never, not one time that I turned a person down from either taking a picture or talking with them or signing an autograph. And, you know, I, I, came, I came from a, a being insecure and being shy and maybe never feeling good enough. And like in that, you know, I was a great track athlete and a great swimmer, but I was never the top in the world or the top in the nation. And, mm-hmm. you know, I was so I was never the best best at anything. I was just good at a lot of things. And, you know, I've always been really sensitive and caring. And I grew mm-hmm. up with my mom and dad teaching me you know, to love, love people and treat them the way you want to be treated. And if there's an underdog, you go to the underdog and you help them and you boost that person. And, you know, now I'm a Christian now, and that's exactly what we do. That's what Mm -hmm. the Lord wants us to do is you love people and you love God and you help people and you boost them when you can. And, you know, I've done that my whole life, taking care of the underdog. Or I remember in high school, there was a boy and he was handicapped you know Mm -hmm. and mentally handicapped and nobody liked him and so we liked him and we would bring him to our house and he'd be our friend and you know there was you know we always would find the underdog or the misfit you know and they would become our friend my family's friend and Mm -hmm. so I've I've taken that 
my whole life and I've taught that to my kids too. My, my, you know, I've got two kids now, 22 and 21 years old. And that's the first thing I taught them is, you know, you take care of people and that's what the Lord wants you to do. And that's what you want to do. It makes you feel good. And if you were in the same boat, wouldn't you, you know, we feed the homeless. We do, we do Mm -hmm. things to help people. And I've done that my whole life. And now I can put a label on it, which is called Christianity. But when I was a kid, I didn't have that label. It was just mom and dad taught us this, you know, this is what mom and dad taught us to do. Right. Right. Well, I think you hit the nail on the head. I think that's why you were so popular. I think people could see how genuine you were and how nice you were to people. And, you know, I think that came through and I think that's why people responded so well to you. And then I always would te- would treat people like I'd think, okay, they're going to ask you the same question that 3,500 other people have just asked you, but mm-hmm. it's their question, and it's the first time they get to ask it, and it's the first yeah. time they talk to you. And so right, I, would treat, right. I would treat every single question and person as if I'd never heard that question before. And yeah, yeah. I would... I have a way where I can look at the person and not see anybody around me. And my eyes would penetrate that person and they knew I was talking to them and I was not right. paying attention. You really, I just, you were really hearing them. Yeah. Yeah. Really hearing them. And if there was ever like a person in a wheelchair, I'd get up and I'd go to the back of the line. I'd grab the person with the wheelchair and you know what? It's just, that's how I want to be treated. And so it's easy to do. It's easy to be nice. It's really mm-hmm. easy to be nice and it feels <laughs> good. And, and if, you know, that's how I want to be treated. And I get so mad sometimes where some of the guys that would be signing autographs, they kind of just sign the autograph and not even look up and, and yeah. kind of, it really hurt my feelings, you know, because this person has been standing in line and right. idolizes you and loves you and just wants eye contact, give them a smile or something, you know, but they be yeah, so yeah. focused on signing the autographs that they forgot the reason why they're signing the autographs. They're signing the yeah. autographs because somebody loves them. Right, right, exactly. It's funny, too, that you and Lee Haney were both Olympia winners during the 80s because both of you had the same kind of personality and you're both great with the fans and Lee's a great mm-hmm. representative for the sport, just like you are. So mm-hmm. that was really a great time in bodybuilding in the 80s to have both of you leading the way. Lee is just absolutely amazing. I mean, I just yeah, have so much respect for him and his wife and his family. And what he's doing now is just, you know, I think if I could redo something in my life, it would be to have been able to have somebody bring God into my life earlier. Like, just because I think I think it's really, really important for couples to be on track and be able to balance mm-hmm. their mind, their body, and their spirit. And what happens with a lot of bodybuilding, like Gary Stridham and a lot of the bodybuilders that, you know, were possibly married at one time and aren't, is you're mm-hmm. so focused in the season of competing. It's such a strong season. It's your livelihood that you don't look, it, you know, and that's your body. And then what mm-hmm. about your mind is a lot of times you're not really focusing on growing your mind because you're so focused on the body. And then the yeah. last leg of it is fake. You don't even pay attention to it, you know, yeah. because yeah. so the balance is off. You know, the tripod isn't, isn't correct. And so, you know, I, I think the most important thing for all people, athletes, married couples, business people, whatever, kids, Mm-hmm. promoters anybody is to have that balance between mind body and, and faith you know and then they're going to be much more successful and happier and be able to produce so much more yeah i don't want to ask about every uh, olympia win you went through here Corey, but i want to ask you about some of the women you competed against because i was looking through the list here from 84 to 89 and it seemed like there was a different woman every year that placed second to you like in 80 80- well, 84, of course, Rachel was second, but then we had Mary Roberts placing second in 1985, and Mary was a really good competitor, wasn't she? Yes. Oh, my gosh. She was She was an animal. She was, like, <laughs> little and powerful and strong, yeah. and, but tiny, you know, and I think there is always an advantage of a tall athlete versus a shorter athlete, not that their body's any different, but... They're bigger, you know, there's more of them to look, there's more of that person to look at on stage. And, right. you know, I took advantage of that. Like I would walk behind Mary and I, <laughs> you know, do a double bicep behind her and she'd be doing one and I'd be like three feet taller than her. And right. you know, 
really making it fun and playful. And I did that with, with Bev Francis too, who's still one of my best friends. So yeah, every year there was like a different person that was hot on my trails and that probably could have just as easily won versus me that year. So first year was Rachel, then it was Mary, and then who was it the next year? Claire Fur in 1986. Yes. Yeah, Claire <laughs> Fur. Oh my gosh. Yeah, she had a great physique. Had like amazing arms. And then who was it the next year? Ellen Van Maris. Ellen Van Maris. Yes, from Bev, Holland. That was third. Yeah. And then what about the next year? Next year, 88, was Anya Langer. And uh, oh, yeah. that was third that year. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I think the person who probably had the most potential to become Miss Olympia was Anya Langer. I mean, yeah. Yeah. He, great physique. Oh, still, you know, and she's had everything. You know, she had, she was taller and lean mm -hmm. and, and, gorgeous and just that natural ability to, to pose. It was just so beautiful and sexy and graceful. Yeah. And I have to say she is absolutely was the person that I would have been most afraid of. And then she didn't yeah. compete anymore. I don't understand what happened because. Yeah, you know, she did kind of drop out. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think she had a, a son. I think she had a, in fact, it was funny because one year her and I met down in Santa Monica and I had my son Boris and she had her son. We were walking around, you know, she was in town from Germany and, you know, here we were the two people that were so competitive with each other and we're hanging out with our kids. You know, it's awesome. Mm -hmm. Yeah, she's, she was amazing. And then who was it the next year? The last um, year in 89 was Sandy Rydell. Oh yeah. And that's when I quit. Yeah. I saw that I couldn't keep up anymore. You know, it was like, I, my body wasn't changing anymore and I was still, mm -hmm the same lean 145 147 pound athlete and right you know and i she was so much more muscular than me and i was like okay i don't want to ever lose you know this is kind of cool having yeah. a winning streak and it's time for me to go and i think i was 30 or 32 or something and i was starting to think okay you know you got to start thinking about kids and mm -hmm. you know after 35 it's going to be harder to have a baby and you know i just think i had I think a couple of things. A, I don't think I could have kept up with that kind of muscularity. And B, I was—I mm -hmm. think I was burnt out. Without me knowing it, I think I was burnt out. I can believe it with that schedule you had. I mean, you were training so much and, and guest posing every weekend and doing seminars and uh, competing every year and oh, winning right. every year. So I can understand. Yeah. yeah, it was. Yeah, it was. I, you know, it was a lot. And then we had other businesses we were doing with mm -hmm. Samson and Delilah and photo shoots and seminars and and you know appearances on tv and doing our show and it was you know again i think i made it look like it might have been easy because i smile a lot but <laughs> <Right>. maybe <laughs> but under that smile i was like oh my gosh i'm burnt out yeah so, so did you see the sport starting to change because we know obviously the women body was got much much bigger after the 1980s so did you see that trend starting to change change immediately like that year that i quit it was Mm -hmm. You know, the next year, who won the next year? Was it Linda? I believe so, yeah. Yeah, and she she would have kicked my butt on stage. I mean, the trend had changed, and she had beautiful shape and symmetry, but she was bigger than me. And so it, was, mm -hmm. it would be like me against Mary Roberts. Well, it would have been Linda yeah. against me, you know. And I just saw that the when I exited, I did a complete – exit like I didn't really follow the sport and I didn't mm. you know I I just was like okay now I get to live life a little bit and experience you know life a little bit without having to be perfect you know and so I don't think I went to the gym all the time even though I was in shape you know I stayed in good shape but I started playing tennis and doing some other you know skiing and water skiing and snow skiing and do some things mm -hmm. that I really had never been able to do yeah on this show, we do uh, obviously called Bodybuilding Legends. So we talk about most of the shows are the bodybuilders from the 60s, 70s, and 80s. And it seems like there's so many people that love that look of the bodybuilders. And I think you could say the same about the women bodybuilders. If you look at the body, the women bodybuilders in the 1980s, they were very beautiful. They were had some muscle, but not too muscular. They definitely looked like beautiful women, and they had great posing routines. And I think that's why it, that look and that, that era was so popular. It was such, I call it the golden era. I'm sure everybody calls the era they were yeah. in the golden era. <laughs> right, right. To, 
you know, but to me, it was, it was so special and it was entertaining to go to a bodybuilding contest, even if you didn't want to be a bodybuilder because the routines were so beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. That's what I was going to ask about next was the routines. How did you come up with ideas every year? I'm sure you had to try to outdo yourself, right? To come up with a more popular routine or or a a new routine that Mm -hmm. was going to really grab everybody's attention. Yeah. Jeff always picked my music every year. And so he loves music. He loved music. Like he would hear Hmm. a song and he would fantasize about me, you know, like he'd be like in his brain choreographing, like fantasizing, posing to it. And it would actually bring him to, it would bring him to tears. Like he knew the right music when it would bring him to tears. And so, Mm -hmm. you know, we tried to do a little bit different stuff every year. And then I just came up with my own routines. I'd watch like music videos and Janet Jackson Mm -hmm. and I'd, you know, Mm -hmm. try to, put in some stuff one year I put in press handstands and some other stuff and I just mm-hmm. tried to make it a little bit different every year and then I think my best posing routine even though it maybe wasn't the most fun one for me like I love doing I one time posed a Moni Moni and it was so much fun but the best <laughs> posing routine I think that I got the most accolades for was one that I did to Teenage Wasteland I don't remember who uh-huh. the, and it was slow and I think the judges uh, liked it because they were like, okay, she finally slowed down enough where I can actually see her physique and look at the mm. muscles working instead of me just jumping around on the stage. So yeah. I think that was my very best posing routine. But Jeff always picked my music. And then my friends, they're actually a, a music band called the Steel Brothers. They would put my music together and they'd edit it together. Mm. And even when I had my TV show, they would do other music on the TV show too. And you know, oh, they were wow. hilarious, but they would, they would put all the music together for me. So did you announce your retirement, Corey, when you, or did you know in advance before that 89 Olympia that that was going to be your no. last year or did you decide afterwards? I think we kind of decided after Jeff and I discussed okay. it and we were mm-hmm. discussing like slowing down and not having to guest pose so much. And, you know, cause I think he was seeing that it was just really draining me, but I don't think we really announced it until after some time after that we wanted to okay. be sure that we were really done with it. Yeah. When you look at your career now, it looks like it was perfect because you got into bodybuilding at the beginning of the 1980s and then you got out in 1989, right at the end of the decade. I know it was perfect. It really was. And I think anytime you get into a sport in the, the beginning of it, like Jan Todd, who's, who is a power lifter and mm-hmm. she was a world record holder and you know, really launch powerlifting into the women's field. She got into it early too, you know, when it was first yeah. starting. And yeah. um, and she's a legend. And so I think fortunate for me, I got into it early. And if I didn't get into it early, I wouldn't be Miss Olympia. I wouldn't mm-hmm. be who I am. Now you mentioned your TV show. The women's bodybuilding was so popular back then. Like we said, it was getting national television coverage. Did you get other opportunities then because of your Miss Olympia wins? Because you mentioned your TV show, so you guys started that. Yeah, we did. We we started that. I'm trying to think. We did a clothing line, you know, Samson and Delilah. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, Joe Weeder gave us really great ad discounts, you know, in the magazine. So it was feasible for us to take ads out in the magazine. And I think at one point I had a store. I had a store in Chicago in Gurney Mills. It was called Corey Evers. Oh, yeah. And it was clothing. And uh-huh. videos, I was doing exercise videos. I kind of got into the exercise videos at the tail end of, you know, the market, though. You know, Kathy uh-huh. Smith had been doing a bunch of videos and, you know, done really well with them. And I think I got into the, the video market towards the end of it. I still loved doing them. They were fun. And then books. Jeff would write books. You know, we do, like, training books and stuff. So I was kind of still in, you know, in the fitness world. I still was doing magazine articles with Joe and Iron Man and John Balick and, you know, mm-hmm. Joe Peter and stuff. So I was still in it, but a little bit less. So it was just different. It was more where I could actually focus on growing up and, you know, deciding what I wanted to do with my life. What about the movies, Corey? Because we all remember when you were in that movie with uh, Jean-Claude Van Damme. Oh my gosh, that was such a fluke. <laughs> okay, so John Jean-Claude was at the gym one day and He's like, oh, you should be this character, Kara, and you'd be great at it. And I go, okay, you know, and I didn't have an agent. I didn't have any acting skills whatsoever other than being me on TV and, you know, teaching stuff. And so he gave me the part. I didn't even have to try out for it. Wow. No kidding. Unbelievable. Yeah. And then every other part I got, 
I never tried out for because I suck as an actress and I don't know how to <laughs> try out in front of like producers, you know? And so uh-huh. then we, my sister and I were sisters in a show called Briscoe County Jr. And we were the German sw- sisters. And we mm-hmm. basically got given that part from a guy named Bruce Campbell, who is the main actor. And then we were on Renegade. We got given that part and I'm trying to think what other shows I was in. I think Oliver Stone put me in a movie and, you know, really? but I, I got put into things, but I never really, like if I, and then Hercules, that was my favorite. Oh yeah. Kevin right. Sorbo's series of Hercules and he pretty much gave me the part, you know, and it mm-hmm. was just, that was awesome because I actually really had a part in that one. It wasn't just a little part. It was a pretty big part and I had a recurring mm-hmm. character and he wow. helped me so much and he would, rehearse the lines with me and just suggest how he thought it should be, how I could do it. And uh-huh. he was patient and wonderful. And the staff was amazing. And it was such a good experience for me. It really, really was. But wow. I don't think I ever tried out for a part. I think the few things that I did get to do were ones that just somebody said, hey, you should use Corey, you know, it's like, okay. <laughs> Unbelievable. Yeah. I know. What was the feedback after that John claude Van Damme movie? Because that was pretty, he was very popular at the time and the oh action movies were really popular. They loved it. They did the, they, they did a, te- like a test market here in California uh-huh. and the, they did feedback with all the people that watched it and they all wanted more of my character. So <laughs> wow, that's great. They actu- actually, I was not even there was we reshot a scene in California. We shot the whole show, the movie in Hong Kong, but because the audience wanted more of Kara, which was my character, mm-hmm. the producer created a new scene of really? me <laughs> in a boat where I came out of the ceiling rafters and I fought just Oh yeah, yeah, I remember that. That yeah. was all done <laughs> here, like months after the show was edited, and they added that oh, in. Oh wow! Uh huh. Now, what year was that, Corey? Was that after you were done competing? Oh, yeah. That was, I think, 1991. Okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So did you ever want to do like like Arnold did and go into the movies and be a, a leading actress and stuff? Never wanted to. No. No. Just, mm-hmm. just these roles just came up. Yep. Never wanted to. Wow. I didn't really like how I, you know, the few things that I did do, you know, I didn't really like how the women were treated a little bit differently than the men and that type of thing. And I'm like, no, nah, I'm not going to do that. I'm not, <clears throat> I'm not going there. And so if somebody gave me the part, it was somebody I knew. And then, you know, yeah. I had a great experience. I had a great experience like Kevin Sorbo, the most respectful, yeah. wonderful man ever, you know, and I think I did mm-hmm. a part on Lois and Clark and it was Dean Kane was awesome and respectful and yeah. wonderful. But, you know, at one point we were talking about doing a TV series with Oliver Stone called The She-Hulk, and it was going to be part animated and part part live, you know. And hmm. so it was something we were re- we met with Stan Lee, and we were going to do it. Wow. And then he started doing a movie called China, and then he just never went back into wanting to produce it. But it was right ar- around mm-hmm. the time when Xena the Warrior Princess came out, you know. So it, was, it would have been the perfect timing because – you know, women, I mean, now you look at every, you know, every movie has a female that kicks butt, you know, in (laughs) it, and that could have been me, because, you know, I think I was ahead of my time, you know, at that point, I was ahead of my time, I could kick butt, you know, but I don't know if the world was ready for it yet. Right, right. Yeah, I guess, I guess you had to be uh, a little cognizant also of how the women were portrayed, right? Because I I heard stories that uh, Rachel was supposed to be in one of the alien sequels, but they wanted her to swear a lot and be this real tough girl. And I don't think she wanted to do that. So I, yeah, I, I guess I, with being a woman bodybuilder and being muscular, they might typecast you, right? Of course, you know, but like, yeah. you know, and I think with Rachel with that is she's, she's also a Christian and I don't think that right. felt so good for her. I think other women bodybuilders would have been absolutely fine with that part, you know, and mm-hmm, right. um, you know, she just put her foot down and said, no, that's not me. And yeah. You know, if Rachel's in a movie, you don't look at it and think, oh, she's some alien. You know, it's Rachel. You can't mm-hmm. separate, just like Arnold. It's like, you know, it's Arnold whether he's the twin with Danny DeVito or not. It's still Arnold. Oh, the um, Terminator, yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's still Arnold. And so, yeah, I'm sure, you know, 
yeah, they either want you to be like real sexual or they want you to be real aggressive and mean. And, you know, right. I mean, even my character with Jean-Claude, you know, I was like a, a redheaded bodyguard murderer, you know, yeah, they had to dye my hair red because they said it as a blonde, I look too nice, you know, and I'm like, okay, <laughs> right. Right. dye my hair red and it will bring out the beast in me. Yeah, <laughs> that's funny. Well, it was, that'd be a great experience. So all the all the acting jobs you had, you know, because that'll live on forever. Oh, it was, you know, and it was like when we were in Hong Kong, Janet Jackson was in town and she happened to be a fan of mine, believe it or not. I'm oh, like, wow. No kidding. <laughs> so she called the hotel that we were at and she invited us to go to her concert and to be backstage with her. And she was so cute. I mean, seriously, <laughs> just a little girl and so adorable. And, you know, we got invited to go on the um the USS Independence, the aircraft carrier, and mm -hmm. Jeffrey Lewis and I and John Claude, we got to have Thanksgiving dinner, you know, on the aircraft carrier with the wow. with the, the sailors, you know, the Marines, and so I've had a lot of really great experiences. My sister and I were invited to fly and land on the John C. Stennis nuclear aircraft carrier to boost the morale of the sailors. You know, I don't know wow. if all sailors okay. or Marines. And so we were on there for three nights, and it was amazing. And our Marines are so smart and classy and unbelievable. And, you know, some of these, some of the women were top gun pilot type fighters. Yeah. And I couldn't believe it. They were so cute, but they were so strong and smart mm -hmm. and just, unbelievable like i was so impressed i have never felt such honor than to be on those aircraft carriers right i mean so humbling experience like crazy yeah wow that's amazing well Corey, i want to thank you for joining us on the bodybuilding legends podcast it was a real honor to talk to you i think you're one of the greatest women bodybuilders ever so it was really yeah. an honor to have you on the show and i think you're one of our greatest champions in either the men or the women's Oh. bodybuilding history so it, it's really an honor to talk to you oh my gosh it's such an honor being on there too i mean seriously i had so much fun and i hope people got to learn a little bit and i yeah. wish you the best of luck with your podcast and thank you so much for inviting me oh you're welcome for you thank you for showing up and uh i wish you all the best oh thank you so much all right, thanks for listening to another episode of the Bodybuilding Legends podcast. Thank you very much to Corey Everson and also my friend Ruth Silverman for getting Corey to call us and do an interview with the Bodybuilding Legends podcast. I hope you like that. And we're going to try and get some more women bodybuilders on the show who are from that 1980s era. All right, thanks also to all our Patreon sponsors. If you want to help support the show on Patreon, go to the website, bodybuildinglegendsshow.com. In the upper right-hand corner, you'll see the Patreon button you want to contribute five bucks a month or 10 bucks, whatever you can do, I would really, really appreciate it. It'll be very helpful to keep the show going. I also want to thank our sponsors, Florida Alternative Medicine, and of course, Old School Labs for sponsoring this episode of the Bodybuilding Legends podcast. Have a great week, everybody. We will see you next week. Take care. So what's the best way to build muscle? Do you train heavy like a power lifter, or do you use light weights and pump out the high reps? Do you train to failure using force reps and drop sets, or do you use a slow progressive resistance system? My name is John Hansen. I'm a three-time Natural Mr. Universe and the first Natural Mr. Olympia winner, and I have over 40 years of experience in training and competition experience. And for the first time ever, I'm gonna reveal all my secrets in a two-day seminar that's gonna take place on March 21st and 22nd in Tampa, Florida. This two-day seminar will consist of both a classroom setting and hands-on instruction in the gym. This seminar, I'm gonna discuss many topics, including the science of building muscle, what actually makes a muscle grow, the different muscle fiber types, how to incorporate all this into your workout. I'm gonna discuss how to build the body in accordance with the principles of muscle mass, symmetry, proportion, and shape. You're gonna learn how to overcome stubborn body parts, how to use goals and visualization to help you build your physique the difference between intensity versus volume, and the best exercises to use to build the maximum amount of muscle mass possible. I'm also gonna discuss the complex subject of nutrition, including eating the proper amount of macronutrients, fueling your muscles for the workouts and for recuperation, and the best supplements to use. 
I'll also talk about how to get ripped and keep your muscle mass at any age. And don't forget the one-on-one -on -one instruction in the gym. This part of the seminar alone will save you years of trial and error. I'm gonna go over all the important muscle building exercises and instruct each member of the seminar on how to properly perform them for the maximum benefit. So if you're ready for a two-day bodybuilding seminar that's gonna save you years of trial and error, come out to Tampa, Florida, March 21st, 22nd. Go to my website, johnhansonfitness.com and sign up today. Remember, we're only taking 15 people at the seminar, so don't delay, sign up today. johnhansonfitness.com, right here in beautiful Tampa, Florida. I'll see you there.